Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Welcome to Vineyard. How are we feeling this morning? Oh, come on. We can do better than that. How are we feeling this morning? That's what I'm talking about. My name is Parker. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and we are continuing our series called Running with the Giants, part six. And we get this series out of Hebrews chapter 11. The author like lists these amazing members of the faith and, and briefly summarizes how they contributed to where we're at today. And then we get to this verse in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. You may even have it memorized by now. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, the sin that so easily entangles, and run the race with perseverance marked out for us. So we've been pulling a person down one at a time, examining his or her life, uh, looking at the things they did well, and applying them to our own. We've seen some people achieve the promise of God, some not. But the thing that has been the, the, the most uh, common theme between each person is that they were obedient to God. See, I love that the author of Hebrews uses this illustration, this metaphor of a race. I like to claim that I am a runner. You know, I ran track. Anybody play uh, sports in high school or middle school? Yeah, uh, I ran track. The last time I ran track uh, competitively was like 10 years ago, but I still claim it, you know? I swear I'll be 30, 40, 60, 80 years old still saying, yeah, back in my day, I used to run track. And my future wife gonna say, Parker, it's been 65 years. <laughs> you like how I spoke that in faith? I said, future wife, in Jesus' name, somebody say, amen. <laughs> All right, thanks for coming out today. That's all I got. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, look to the person next to you. Say, today. Yeah. Come on with some feelings. Say, today. Yeah. You see, today, I'd like to take you back. I'm going to take you back to thousands of thousands of thousands of years ago. I want you to imagine yourself in the middle of the desert. You look around. You, you start to see people gathering Matter of fact, you start to see two groups of people gathering. They look like they're, they're prepping for war, prepping for battle. You hear the sounds of armor. You, you hear the sounds of metal. You, you, you start to hear these foot stomps like growing and building. And then all of a sudden, you, you kind of see these two groups of people running towards each other. The stampede is so loud. It's, it's like nothing you've ever seen before. Hollywood could not depict this well. You start to hear the sound of metal on metal, metal on flesh. You look around, you see one by one, five by five, ten by ten, people just falling down everywhere. And as you look up, you, you notice that on this hillside, you notice something. Or a matter of fact, I should say someones. You see three people, and, and the guy in the middle kind of steps forward, and you can tell he's the leader. He kind of takes this, this position of authority and then all of a sudden he, he extends his, his hands in the air and he starts shouting something, but you can't quite make it out at first. At first you think he's shouting commands, but no, he's, he's not telling people which way to go or, or this flank move that way. He doesn't say anything like that. He, he's shouting not at any one particular person and so you listen closer and you notice that as his hands are in the air, he's shouting and praising God. And then you notice that as his hands are in the air, that his side starts to win. But as his hands lower, his side starts to lose. And you kind of see him like muster up strength again and he, he shoots his arms in the air and he, he keeps praising and they start winning again. But, but his praises start to fall short, his arms start to get weak and then the two people on his side grab his arms and, and hold it up for him. And then all of a sudden, his side wins. 
They won the battle. <laughs> this leader was Moses. And those people were the Israelites. I think if Moses could look at us today and said, if you only got one thing from this entire message, if you walk out of this building and only remember one sentence that Pastor Parker said, let it be this. Moses would tell us to live life from a position of praise. Live life from a position of praise. I remember one time on my phone, I got this news notification, probably from the New York Times or something like that. And, and I read the headline and it said something like this. It said, psychologists say an attitude of gratitude will take you to the next level in life. And I thought, you just now figuring this out? <laughs> this is new to you? Jesus has been talking about this for 2,000 years. God's been talking about it since way before then. I said, scientists, y'all need to catch up because the Bible has been saying this. <laughs> But I thought it was funny, but also very true. Moses would remind us that God has called us to run a race, but you don't just hop on the track and wing it and hope to win. There's rules, there's guidelines, there's, there's steps to success. And one of those is gratitude. One of those is praise. Now, how many of you know it's real easy when times are good? But when times get hard, <laughs> I don't know where the praise is at. See, at birth... Uh, uh, when Moses was born, I'm going to give you some backstory to that moment I brought you to, because so much happened before then. But when Moses was born, the Pharaoh of Egypt actually issued this degree that, that any person under a certain age that was a Hebrew uh, was supposed to be killed. And so at birth, Moses' mom says, we're not about to have that happen. And so she puts him in a basket and, and her, her daughter and, and him send Moses down the Nile River. Now, what's interesting about this is the Egyptians pretty much worshipped the Nile. They, they, I mean, their, their civilization was built around it. They flourished because of it. I mean, again, place yourself in the middle of the desert. It barely rains all year long. And then you come across this river, and along the banks of the river are green fields. You stay there, right? I mean, it's like going to Sam's Club, and they're handing out these samples. You go right there. Sometimes you even take a lap around like, oh, what is this? I don't know what this is. And you eat it again. <laughs> you see, the Nile River would flood from about June to September. And during this flood, it would water the fields that the Egyptians would use to harvest their crops later in the season. And so they, the Egyptians, they had this god called the god Happy. And I have a picture for you guys that you can, you can look. Uh, and there's, there's two of him. That's him twice. He kind of represents the northern side of the Nile and the southern side of the Nile. And what they would do is they would throw sacrifices into the river. Jewelry, food, possessions. In very, very, very rare circumstances, there's a few accounts of people. So when, when Moses' mother was sending her son in the Nile, it was almost like she was fulfilling her duty to the, to the Pharaoh to sacrifice, to quote-unquote kill her son, but believe that God was going to make a way otherwise. And so Moses is going down this river, and, and, and then he is met by the Pharaoh's daughter, who's bathing in this river, presumably to, to absorb the fertility powers that came from the god Happy. And she sees Moses and kind of says, oh, this must be a blessing from the gods. And, and, and she takes him into her household, but little did she know, God had another plan. And so Moses ends up growing up in the Pharaoh's courts. But he's fully aware that he is an Israelite, that he is of Hebrew origin. And so he kind of lives his life, he's, he, he gets a, a much older and he's walking through the streets of the city and he notices and he looks at all of his people who are slaves. Enslaved by the Egyptians, been in captivity, the Bible says Moses was the second generation born into slavery. And, and so he's seeing all of this horrific stuff happen and he notices that a slave master just beats one of the Hebrews. And Moses gets angry. He, he lashes out. He reacts in passion, strikes the slave master, and kills him. He starts to freak out. He's like, oh, what did I just do? The Pharaoh hears about it and, and is looking for him. And so instantly he flees. He flees Egypt. He gets out of there. He, he runs away, and he goes to this place called Midian. And when he gets to Midian, fearing his punishment, he just kind of stays there. He builds a new life. He, he becomes a shepherd. He gets married to his boss's daughter and, and starts to have a family and uh, continues to live his life. And then we get to a point where he's in his 30s, maybe 40s. 
And he's on top of a mountain just living his normal life, trying to live his best life, you know. And, and God sees him and says, this is my opportunity. And then Moses looks over and sees this burning bush. But not like a normal burning bush. The bush actually, the leaves aren't falling off. It's not falling to the ground. It's just on fire in a sense. And so he gets curious and says, well, I got to see what's going on with this. And so he walks over there and, and the Lord begins to speak to Moses through this bush. And he tells him about the plan that he has for him that, hey, I'm going to use you as a central figure to free your people from the Pharaoh's captivity. You're going to do that. And if he says anything otherwise, don't worry. I'll send signs through you to show him that you mean business. Moses doesn't say, all right, Lord, let's do this. <laughs> he doesn't say, sign me up, God. He doesn't say, here I am, Lord, send me. <laughs> that is not what happens. Matter of fact, Moses says this to the Lord. He says, pardon your servant, Lord. At least he was respectful, right? I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant right now. I am slow of speech and tongue. Moses is basically saying, you want me, this guy right here, to go to the Pharaoh and tell him that you're going to free all of the, 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 the Hebrews? No, you, you got it twisted, God. This is not me. I don't speak well under pressure. Not a public speaker. Choose somebody else. God responds by reminding him who gave him his mouth. He reminds him who gives him his speech. And he finishes it with this. Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. Somebody say go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But still, this isn't enough for Moses. His insecurity kind of gets the best of him. And he replies with, pardon your servant, Lord. I don't think you heard me the first time. Use someone else. Please send someone else. You must have got the wrong Moses. Uh, Moses Jones lives down the street, but that's not me. Is you got to find somebody else because I am not your guy. Moses was blinded by his insecurity. He couldn't see God's plan. I mean, he had been several years detached from Egypt. He didn't even grow up in the Israelite suffering. He couldn't see everything. He was so far detached that his family, his, his job, he couldn't see past Midian. Now, I don't necessarily think that Moses was being selfish. I also don't necessarily think that Moses doubted God. I think Moses' insecurity in himself was so much larger than anything other than that. God speaking to Moses caught him to doubt his position in life. God speaking to Moses made him realize that he was in the wrong place. It reminded him of the pain, the confusion, the responsibility of his actions that he never took back in Egypt, and he didn't want that. Moses heard God's plan and probably thought, why would the people of Israel follow me? Didn't grow up like them. I didn't live like them. Matter of fact, I did something wrong and, and a leader doesn't run away. A leader takes ownership of it and I ran away. God, why would they follow me? But God looked at him and he said, you're focusing too much on what's opposing you and not enough on what the purpose that I have for you. You're focused on too much of what your opposition is and not where I'm trying to place you so that I could use you. Point number one is this. Get into position and stand your ground. Get into position and stand your ground. A lot of our life frustrations, I think, come because we try to reconcile this distorted view of what we think our life should be in our minds, and we try to compare that to what actually is. You see, when we realize our ideal destination isn't within our immediate grasp, we tend to bend towards the easier, quicker outcome. When an athlete runs a race, step one isn't to win. Step one is to get into position. It's to get into your lane, step up to your line, and to get ready. You see, you can be in position, but if you're in the wrong place, you won't be paying attention. The gun will signal you to run, and you'll miss it. You'll be behind. You're in the wrong lane, and you're trying to run your race, you'll probably be disqualified. If you're going the wrong direction, well, that's just kind of sad. <laughs> It's kind of like when you go to a t-ball game and you see the kid hit the ball and then he runs to the left instead of the right and you're like, oh, that's kind of cute, but in a really sad type of way for you and your family. I can make that joke because I did that, so. <laughs> we get frustrated that God isn't moving in our lives, but we're not even in position yet. 
We haven't stepped up to the line. We're not even playing the same sport as him and we get mad at God. See, I believe that God is a God of miracles, that he desires nothing but the absolute best for our lives. But we live in a fallen world, and so that means that sometimes, in the most theological way I could say it is possible, life's just going to suck. We mess up. We aren't where we're supposed to be. You get into a car accident. You open up another credit card after you told yourself you'd pay off your debt. You miss another one of your child's sports games or recitals because of work or just general exhaustion. We're allowed to acknowledge the struggle. That's okay. We're absolutely allowed to acknowledge that this life is hard. Matter of fact, Jesus told us it wouldn't be easy. But what we're not allowed to do is blame God when we're not even in position. Why? Why is this not okay? Because when we're in this position, it seems impossible. It seems like we'll never be able to stand up, and it seems like we'll never be able to get in position. But I'm pretty sure that the Bible says what's impossible with man is completely possible with God. Because Jesus made a way for us so you can and will get into position. Romans 6 actually says it like this. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Moses says he would tell us that sin does not bind you anymore. So get into position. Get into position physically, but also get into position mentally and spiritually. If you're going to run this race, you need to get up early so that you can get ready. You need to get up early so that you can praise God and, and, and read your Bible or shoot, at least listen to the Bible. The Bible app is so great. It's so easy nowadays. Pastor Jacob said a couple weeks, you got to get to the devil before he gets to you. And I believe that. You've got to get ready. Moses knew that this was essential. It's hard to see your purpose if you're not in position. Moses eventually agrees with God. He heads towards Egypt. And just coincidentally, along the way, he ends up meeting with his brother Aaron, who just so happens to be an amazing public speaker. Imagine God coming through. <laughs> they get to Egypt. They rally the Israelites. They agree to go before the Pharaoh. And then Moses steps up and he says his famous line, God told me to tell you to let my people go. Mic drop. He steps back all excited and proud. Pharaoh says no. Pharaoh says no a lot, actually. And then this is where we get the 10 plagues. Now, if I could just drop a couple tidbits of knowledge and wisdom your way. A lot of theologians and historians believe that the 10 plagues actually matched up with many of the uh, Egyptian gods that they worshipped. And so with every plague, God was saying, I know that you worship this person, but let me show you how I have authority and control over this aspect of, of the universe. And just an example, there is one of the plagues where God turns the Nile into blood. Blood's not good for crops. I bet Heppy wasn't very happy about that one. <laughs> and then God makes it dark in, in Egypt for three days, and they worshipped Ra, the sun god. I bet he wasn't feeling too bright after that. You can, you can look it up. I swear they're all in there. But he gets to the final plague, and by the time the Pharaoh has been through ten of them, he says, please, go. <laughs> Just get out of here. I'm tired of this. I can't deal with y'all anymore. Please get out of my face. And so Moses is like, okay. And they gathers the people, they leave Egypt, and they start to head away. And they get to the Red Sea. And then this is where they kind of set up camp for a moment. And after they've completely left, Pharaoh kind of realizes, shoot, my free labor is gone. And so he sends his army to go after them to pull them back in. And so the Israelites, they wake up one morning, and they look out over the horizon and they see this army kind of stampeding towards them. They freak out. They get scared. They look at Moses like, what is going on? Why is this happening? And it was Moses' job to hear from God and to speak to them. And, and, and they get so frustrated and so angry. This is actually what they say. Was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. 
The Israelites see themselves surrounded. On one side, the Red Sea, no boats to get them across. On the other side, the Pharaoh's army uh, fastly approaching them. And here we see that they are ready to trade freedom for slavery at the first sign of struggle. They're ready to give up everything Moses just fought for at the first sign of struggle. How many, of us, how many of us have ever said the words, man, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Your spouse asked you to go out. And you said, I'm not going out because this is going to happen. And she said, no, be fine. And you go out and it happens. Man, I told you I shouldn't have gone out. You let your child go out. Don't you be doing this, though. They do that. Man, I told you I shouldn't have done that. Or shoot, let's even take it further. God tells you to take a risk on a job. It doesn't work out. You try individual or couples therapy. Can't seem to break through that barrier. You start paying off your credit card and then your car breaks down. And you look at God and say, God, I told you I shouldn't have done that. I told you I shouldn't have trusted you here. I told you this was not okay, Lord. But Moses looks them at, I think Moses would look at us in the eyes during this circumstance and, and he would say, point number two, stand your ground even if you feel surrounded. Stand your ground even if you feel surrounded. Lock in that position of authority, stand your ground, begin to praise God and understand that even when it looks like you're surrounded, the only thing you're actually surrounded with is the Holy Spirit. Even when it looks like you're surrounded, the only thing that's got, you, got your back is God's presence. It's like that song says, even when it looks like I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded by you, Lord. Remind yourself that God is faithful. The enemy's job is to kill, steal, and destroy. But not just anything. He specifically targets the things of God. He specifically targets what God is trying to do in our life. And he's good at it. That means when we get into a position of praise and we start to thank God for stuff that hasn't even happened yet, guess what's going to happen? He's going to wither his way right into our life. The moment you start to do something good for God, the enemy's going to come and try to undermine that. He's good at making us question God. He's good at making us feel weak. He's good at making us feel powerless and overwhelmed. He's good at reminding us of the past, even though we've, we've gotten over that. He's good at reminding us of our family history, even though we're different from them. You have to stand your ground in the battle. And here's the truth. If he's coming around in your life, you must be doing something right, because he's not going to waste his time on nobody. So keep pushing forward. Stand in a position of praise and thank God. Thank God that what the world meant to harm you, he promises to use for your benefit. Remind yourself and thank God that for whatever weakness is present in your life is really just an opportunity for his power to overflow. Moses knew this. He looks at the Israelites and he tells them this, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see, today you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. God tells Moses to step up to the Red Sea, to raise his hand and to raise his staff and to speak to the sea. And just like in Bruce Almighty, when he was in that diner and that soup bowl split in half, that Red Sea also split in half. <laughs> the Bible says that the Israelites walk through on dry ground. They get to the other side. For some reason, the Egyptians' army decided it would be a good idea to follow them. And so they're following them through the Red Sea, and the waves crash against them, forming the sea again. The Israelites are safe. They made it. But imagine if they gave up. Imagine if right then and there, they, they laid on the ground and, and decided that it was their time to, to just go back to Egypt. We'll just accept death. We'll accept slavery. This is what you have for us. All right, it's fine. They never would have seen the miracle. They never would have seen the miracle if they gave up. And I'm telling you today, you will not see your miracle if you give up right now. I think there's somebody in this place who's been fighting so hard for something to happen and you haven't seen it yet and the enemy's trying to tell you to give up and God's saying right now, this is your reminder. The miracle is around the corner. Keep pushing through. There comes... A uh, time after this, they start to travel, right? 
They head through uh, uh, the, uh, the past Egypt and, and into new territory, and, and a lot happens here. You know, Moses prays, and, and manna falls from the heavens, and God feeds the, the Israelites with quail, and, and Moses makes water come out of a rock because God is, is faithful and, and, and gives water to his people. And, and, and then they kind of set camp. They build the tabernacle, the Ten Commandments. The law is expanded upon. The judges' system is established. So much happens. And then there comes this moment in Moses' life where the people are thirsty again, and we're in the desert. But they're complaining so much, it's just kind of overwhelming to Moses. And we can all relate to that when somebody just keeps complaining about the same thing. And Moses goes to God, he says, Lord, I cannot deal with this anymore. You need to help him out. You got to do something. And God says, don't worry about it. (laughs) Got you. And he instructs Moses, hey, there's a rock, gather the people, lift your hands, speak to the rock, and water will come through. So Moses says, thank you, God, praise God. And he gathers the people, he, he, he steps around the rock, and he says, God's going to give us some water. He takes his staff, but instead of listening to God, he strikes the rock two times, and water comes flooding through the rock. So even though he made a mistake, God is faithful even when we do that. (laughs) Even when we decide to live outside of God's best, he's still going to move because he loves us. But it was actually this mistake right here. For one reason or another, there's many theories on that, that kept Moses from entering the promised land. The land that he had been fighting for, the promise that was given hundreds of years prior to, to his ancestor Abraham. That promise... He sits on top of this mountainside and he's able to look at all of this land and and see the land that the Israelites will enter into. But on that mountain, Moses dies. You know, maybe it's just me, but I'm sure you can relate to this too. There are things in my life that I feel like I've labored for for so long, but still have not seen them come to fruition. People I have spent years praying for that still don't trust in God a heart that I have labored for to get over past sins, protecting my purity, trusting God, being obedient to him, but I still haven't become the father or husband that I know I'm called to be. Grieving for what feels like an eternity in the most healthy way I know possible, but still feeling broken inside. Life can seem like we are Moses. Destined to never see the promise fulfilled. On one end, I have opposition. And on another end, I have victory. But it feels like I'm stuck in between both worlds. It feels like I'm being pulled from one side to the other, Lord, and I don't know how to manage this. I can't help but be reminded of that moment I told you earlier. That moment where Moses stood on top of that mountain and locked his hands in the air and said, I'm praising God for victory. I'm praising God for a victory I haven't even seen yet. I'm praising God for the land I haven't even stepped foot in yet. I'm praising God for the promise that I don't even know if it's going to happen yet, Lord, but thank you in advance. I think Moses would look at us in our doubt and he'd say, you're not in this position. You're not getting ready. You're not standing your ground just to receive the promise. If we live our life just to get the blessing, we're missing the point. Moses would look at us and he would say, you're in a position of praise because first and foremost, God is worthy. We lift our hands in worship, not because it is a requirement or it makes me look cool, but because God deserves it. I don't think Moses would look at us and say, oh, this was the biggest regret of my life. I think if he had the opportunity to change it, he would, but who wouldn't? But I think he would say, if my life is summed up in that one moment, then I've done something wrong. I don't think Moses would look back and say that he regretted it necessarily. He would look at us and say, I didn't live my life to get the promise. I lived my life for God. I didn't live my life just to get a blessing. I lived my life to be used and to be an impact to other people. I knew that each and every day when I stepped out of my tent or when I stepped into the the land with my people, 
I knew that my praise, that my leadership, that my life wasn't just for me, but it was for them. That when he stood in a position of praise, he didn't just stand there for himself. People depended on him. People depended on his praise for God. Imagine that. Imagine your relationship with God being depended on by other people. Oh, wait. It is. It is. I think Moses would look at us, and I think the last thing that he would tell us is point number three. Stand your ground. Your battle affects those around you. Your battle affects those around you. Moses knew that his praise for God impacted his people. He knew that as his hands were in the air, they sought victory. That if he gave up, it would cause his army to lose. If he gave up, his people may never see the promised land. Church, I need you to understand today that you're not just fighting for you. You're not just fighting for yourself. There's this concept that we see called generational curses. It's largely found in the Old Testament, kind of this idea that your family sins is passed on to the, to the next generation. But we also see it in psychology too. Studies show that children that come from divorced households are almost twice as likely to get a divorce themselves. That we can actually uh, trace addiction down to our genetics whether it's drug addiction or alcoholism, even poverty can be considered generational curse. Moses knew that stepping on top of that mountain meant more than just praising God, more than just being a leader. It meant fighting for every single Israelite. It meant fighting to keep the freedom that he had worked so hard for them to receive. It meant fighting for them not to be put back in slavery. His praise was dependent on by other people. And he did that whether he knew he was going to see the promised land or not. The author of Hebrews actually talks about this. In verse, or chapter 12, verse 12, it says, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Get into position and praise God. Strengthen your praise. Strengthen your life. Get on a firm foundation because you are making a pathway not just for yourself, but for others to follow you to the Lord as well. Strengthen your praise. I know, yeah, praise God, come on. I know that when I step on this stage, I'm not just preaching for me. I know that I step into this auditorium, I'm not just worshiping for me. I'm fighting for generations of me. I'm fighting for my family. I'm fighting for my future kids, my future grandchildren, for young people. I know that my praise is dependent on by other people, so I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit on God. And you have the opportunity to do the same. And yes, it is not easy. And yes, it is hard. It feels like you're being pushed and pulled and, 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 and trapped in between two sides. And, and you're standing firm and, and you raise your arm. But the moment you do, you get jerked into the opposition. The moment you start to praise God, you're, you're reminded of your past relationship mistakes. And then God says, I have victory for you. And you, you get strength up again and you're, you're praising God. And the moment that you do, uh, memories of addiction pull you down. And, and you raise your hand and, and you're praising God again. And then reminders of adultery or, 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 or past failures are just pulling you left and right. And you're not sure what to do. And you stand here saying that I'm trying to praise you, God, but my praises are weak. And you lower your arms and you're not sure what to do. But fortunately for you, there was a man who took up a similar position as this. So that we wouldn't have to be bound by sin. But we can lift up our hands in freedom and, and be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do something powerful for God. Somebody lift up a shout of praise. That man's name was Jesus, the Son of God. And he didn't come and live this perfect life and lie and die the most gruesome death in history and be resurrected on the third day for us to stay in slavery. Don't get me wrong. It's God's grace and favor and power and his Holy Spirit that gives our praise power. Don't get it twisted. We are not or never will be God. But what I'm trying to make you understand is that the author and the perfecter of our faith 
has a bigger role for you in the kingdom of God than you realize. Has a a much greater authority to give you for your family members, for your children, for your workplace, for you. And so I close with one final question. Are you in position? Am I in position? Moses raised his hands to perform the plagues. Moses raised his hands to part the Red Sea. Moses raised his hands on top of that mountain to get that victory for his people. Let us not underestimate the power of our praise. And may we get into position today. Let's pray. Hmm. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. And that's just God's presence. Hmm. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. We start by thanking you, Father. Hmm. And somebody needed to hear that, that your Father in heaven is unlike any earthly father. He's not bound by the same rules or expectations. His fatherhood is perfect. And so, God, we thank you for that. Lord, we praise you for the victories we've yet to see. We praise you for the lives changed that we have yet to see. The seats in this auditorium that will be filled with our brothers, our sisters, our parents, our friends, Lord. We thank you for that. God, I ask that you would show us and give us the strength to stand in our position, whatever that looks like. Whether that's waking up early and reading our Bible and praying over our children every morning, God. Whether it's praying over our workplaces, Lord, that we would be a better teacher, a better uh, uh, lawyer, God, doctor, male person, Lord, whatever it is, God, that we would lift up our workplaces to you each and every morning, Lord. Maybe that's getting in a small group, Father, surrounding ourselves with people that can encourage us and sharpen us and push us closer to you. Help us get into position, Lord. And I speak right now in faith, Father, that the enemy that is surrounding us, Lord, he's trying to distract us. He makes himself look bigger than he is. He hypes up his his authority in our lives, Father, but we thank you that he has no authority over us. That even in moments of being surrounded, You've got us covered. And Father, and I thank you that our battle is not our own. One, Jesus, that you fought the fight for us already and that victory is already ours and we speak that with authority and faith. And two, Lord, that even though the fight continues, we praise you that the victory spoken over us will come to fruition. The promise still stands. Hmm. Right now, I just want to pray over people who have felt God doing something today. They see this God that I'm talking about. And you may have never decided to trust him. And you may really don't know much else besides what I've spoken about today. But that's okay. God desires us to do life with him. To be in a relationship with him. To not be bound by rules, but to walk side by side with him every single day. And I just want to take a moment to pray for for whoever in here feels like they want to make the biggest decision of their life to make Jesus their Lord and Savior. To acknowledge the fact that the Son of God came down from heaven to die a death for our sins, to be resurrected, defeating that sin, and sending His Holy Spirit to live with us every single day. If that's you, if you've never made that decision before, or maybe it's been years and you would like to commit your life to God this morning, right now. You don't have to wait till tomorrow till you feel ready. God says you'll never be ready, but I'm ready now. And so I'm going to count to three. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, I'm just going to ask that if you want to make that decision that morning, you just shoot your hand up in the air, just high enough so that I can see it. And I just want to know who I'm praying for. I want to be able to support you in that. So if that's you, if that's you, if you want to make that decision this morning, one, Jesus died for you. The Son of God came on this earth so that we could have life and life everlasting too. He gave up his life and was resurrected. He didn't just stay in the grave. He defeated the grave, closing sin on our lives, closing the authority of the enemy on our lives. And three, 
He resurrected to give us new life each and every day. If that's you, shoot your hand up in the air right now. I see you. I see you. I see you. Hmm. I want everyone uh, in this room to pray this prayer with me out loud. Everybody say, Jesus. Hmm. I know I've messed up. I know I make mistakes. Today, I trust you. Today, I follow you. Make me new. Hmm. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.